Well, it's a business question as old as commerce itself. How should an incumbent respond to new entrants in the market? In today's tech-driven world, that question is more important than ever if a firm is to survive or to thrive. So should traditional TV makers work with or flat out compete against internet companies? Let's find out. If you walk into a home appliance store these days, you won't find many TV sets that aren't smart. But what factors matter the most when consumers choose a TV? Ping 使用比如说它的这个操作的简便性啊主要是现在四K是主流了。Our interviews seem to coincide with a 2013 survey by II Media Research. That survey showed that when choosing a TV set, the top three factors that concern consumers were quality, price and brand. So just how much pricing and branding power rests in the hands of traditional manufacturers? The industry consulting company AVC estimates that nearly 45 million TV sets were purchased in China in 2014. Internet companies such as Xiaomi and LETV registered a four-fold increase in the number of TVs they sold, but shared only 6% of the market. Those numbers translate into a simple fact. 94 of every 100 TV sets purchased in China in 2014 came from traditional manufacturers. Still, while the internet companies hold little sway in the market, experts say their efforts have forced prices down by as much as 2,000 yuan per TV since 2013. The revolution has just started. Smart TV will spread toward the end of this year. When users suddenly come to realize, oh, I can use a TV this way, the change will erupt. Only until then will many companies flock into the field of smart TVs as they did with smartphones. Traditional TV manufacturers no doubt were the first players to sense the winds of change and would be wrong to view them just as a group of middle-aged geezers trying to vainly keep up with the young, hip internet guys. The geezers are reacting as fast as the fashion dictates. Another approach for the TV manufacturers is to develop deeper ties with internet companies by co-designing products or even co-establishing branch companies. TCL and video website iQiyi, for example, together have produced smart TVs since September 2013. Meanwhile, Skyworth and Alibaba have founded a joint venture company to offer low-priced smart TV sets online only. Cooperation is more about making internet services part of the utilities on the hardware, but a joint venture is binding two companies' interests more deeply. This is a question manufacturers have to think about. I personally tend to believe they should consider more in-depth binding of interests with internet companies in order to solve long-term problems. I'm also not going to exclude the possibility that sometime in the future, the internet giants might become stakeholders of traditional manufacturers or even make acquisitions. 
All right, Professor. So the response from traditional TV manufacturers, that is the big question for them, I guess, with all these unconventional players coming in. Traditional TV manufacturers, of course, they have the know-how right now. They have established supply chains and they have dominant market share right now. So how should they view these new entrants? You know, the traditional players will have to respond and they will have to respond very quickly. But then the big question is how, right? Waging a price war is probably not gonna do it because these traditional manufacturers are already selling their hardware at very thin margin, right? So they cannot compete on the prices. But I think a more a viable long-term strategy would be to actively build up your consumer loyalty, right? Mm -hmm. To prove to your consumers that you're better than your competitors. Um, and I think going forward in the future, the TV manufacturers will have a far deeper relationship with its end customers, right? So they will know exactly who is watching their TV and when and how, right? And they can use this information to actively uh, improve their product and service offerings. So in a broad sense, Professor, do you think that traditional TV manufacturers these days sort of already lost their first mover advantage? If you look at LETV and Xiaomi combined, they sold about uh, 2 million TV sets, which is only a fraction of what Hisense have sold last year. They may not be moving as fast as people had anticipated. And I think part of the reason is because um, there is a high learning curve, a high entry barrier to the smart TV sector. On mobile phones, you look for news, you look for uh, social interactive applications, whereas on TVs, people tend to watch movies, you know, videos, uh, play games, and they look for education-related content, right? So the big question is, the kind of success that Xiaomi and Le TV had with their um, mobile phones, can it really translate or transfer in parallel to this new arena, which is smart TV, right? So, and um, if you believe that content is king for smart TV, then I think the learning curve for Xiaomi and Le TV is just as high as it is for the traditional uh, players. I think it's actually becoming a global phenomenon where we have non-traditional TV makers coming into the TV industry. Uh, we saw in the United States first, uh, of course, with Amazon and Apple right. coming into the TV industry. What do you think Chinese players can learn from its Western counterparts? And is there anything that Western counterparts can learn from perhaps several of the business models here from China? There are major differences between the U.S. and the Chinese market. So, for example, in terms of the market size, uh, even though U.S. market is a more mature market, but in terms of the overall size of this market, China is definitely much bigger. Mm. Right? So if you look at the internet population in China, it all, it's already doubled that of the U.S. Right? And if you think about Chinese government, it's still putting out favorable policies like the broadband strategies in China in an effort to make this internet part of the basic infrastructure in this country. Um, so, you know, obviously the market size is much bigger here. And another dimension I think that's vastly different between the U.S. and China is actually uh, the business model maturity, right? So the, in the U.S., this is a mature market. And if you look at the revenue model, most players make their money off of, say, this uh, so-called pay per view right, revenue model. Whereas in China, most of the players are still relying on advertisement as mm. a major source of revenue. Mm -hmm. And this is not going to sustain in the long run. Um, and another aspect that's different is uh, regulation. Right? We've already talked about this. So in the U.S., uh, this is sort of a market-oriented behavior. Right? C companies compete on their own. Whereas in China, uh, the TV sector is one of those sectors that's heavily regulated by the Chinese government. Right? So all the players are running this um, uh, policy risk, so to speak. And another dimension that's different is competition. Right? So in the U.S., I think the U.S. market has already gone through this phase of consolidation. So now what we're seeing is uh, several large players dominating uh, the market. Uh, whereas in China, we have relatively little market concentration right now. So we still see a lot of players in this market trying to establish. Right. So each market right now, the U.S. and China both have their own unique aspects in terms of non-traditional players coming into the smart TV industry, right? Yes, I think okay. so. Okay. Yeah. All right, Professor, we're going to leave that part there for now. And as traditional and TV makers of the new industry fiercely compete in hardware, pricing and content distribution fields of the industry, are they focusing a little bit too much on the other side? What about the 21st century Chinese consumer? How might their viewing and buying habits shape the industry? That's up next.